Okay, so this is the week we go to the coast, and um, I want you to have some background information. Some of you may already know quite a bit about coastal um, ecosystems, but I venture that there might be some things you haven't heard. So we're going to go through one of my favorite topics, um, marine biomes. There are several benefits to living in water. These include natural buoyancy, so you don't have to have a very strong sort of support system, skeletal system, or um, large exoskeletons or anything like that uh, to support you when you walk around because the water provides a great deal of that. Uh, the temperature ranges within water are not as extreme as that which you find on land. Um, there's a much narrower range of uh, temperatures. Nutrients are dissolved and readily available in the water. And you're sort of surrounded by the things that you need easily. And any toxins that you produce or that are produced around you are diluted and dispersed because of the action of the water being a good solvent, taking all of that stuff, dissolving it, and taking it away. All good things. There's some other distinguishing characteristics about living in water. Um, overall, there is much more uniformity on it than you find on land. Organisms can move more freely. There are fewer obstacles for mobility, so to speak. Like, whereas on land, you know, if you're a land animal and you come across a body of water um, or a mountain range or something like that, it might prevent you from moving across that region. Uh, that sort of thing doesn't happen as often in um, oceanic environments. And because of that, diversity is actually a little bit lower in some instances than you would find on land. And this is mainly because the individual niches of little places and the jobs that you might have as an organism in an ecosystem um, are a little less diverse because of that uniformity we were just talking about. Things are, are much sort of more freer and, and, and it's harder to find um, a unique little spot that um, other organisms haven't already filled. Water does tend to moderate temperatures as well. So you remember back when we talked about the importance of water in organisms is that it has a high specific heat, so it, it, once it gets um, a particular temperature, it does not lose that temperature very quickly. It holds on to heat, um, and that is a unique feature that is helpful for organisms if you're actually living in the water. So overall, oceans are pretty important. Let's talk about how that applies to the Earth as a whole. One, it covers about 71% of the Earth depending on which view of the earth um, you see. Uh, you may, um, you know, if you select it, a certain view of the earth, you may only see mostly water and very little land. But there's also a way to look at the earth where you see mostly just land. But uh, truthfully, it makes up most of the planet. And because of that, it helps to distribute solar heat and plays a huge role in the hydrologic cycle. So sun hits the earth, warms up the water, the water holds on to that heat because of its high specific heat. Um, water evaporates, forms clouds, rains back down. All of that helps to regulate climate. It serves as a reservoir for carbon dioxide. Um, so stuff that we off-gas, other organisms off-gas due to normal respiration, gets pulled down and dissolved in water and then can be held in those deep sections of the ocean for long periods of time provides a habitat for more than 250,000 known species, and we are still finding new species every day, so that's amazing. It provides a huge food source for us and for other organisms, but for us due to fisheries, although that brings up some problems also. Um, although the net primary production, the, the sort of net amount of photosynthesis that occurs in the ocean per sort of square meter or something like that is rather rather low. Because the oceans cover so much of the planet, it is the largest contributor to the Earth's overall net primary product productivity, so that it's the, the 
major kind of contributor to photosynthesis on the planet. And then for us, it's a major source of iron, sand, gravel, phosphates, magnesium, oil, natural gas. It, it, you know, it provides a lot. The kinds of organisms you find in the ocean. Uh, there's two main groups. You find plankton, which are those that cannot really swim against the current. And you find, like, examples of those might include um, phytoplankton, which are the ones that, that are dependent on light, the, the plant photosynthetic related plankton. You find bacterioplankton, which are those that are bacteria, like blue-green algae, like we've talked about before, um, and other bacteria. And then you also find zooplankton, and these are your animal plankton. The other major group of organisms are the necton. Necton are those organisms that can swim against the current. All right, so these are all the fish and large organisms that you might think of. Last group are the benthos, and these are the organisms that live on or near the bottom. So they don't spend a lot of time swimming around in the water column. They tend to settle out and either live permanently attached to somewhere on the bottom or are just moving around directly on the bottom. Kind of like the little, you know, crested blenny I have in the classroom. He likes the bottom. Other categories of organisms would include your decomposers, which also would tend to be benthic, but not solely. Um, and they break down dead matter and recycle the nutrients back for other organisms to use. Again, mostly bacteria and other uh, worms and some other things. All right. Uh, there are, however, limiting factors to life in the ocean. Um, and limiting factors are things that affect the growth of a population or whether or not a population can live in a particular area. Some of the things include temperature. Um, obviously, some sections of the ocean are very cold. Um, and there's even some sections of the ocean that are very hot. Um, some high, there's some nice hydrothermal vents um, deep in the ocean that uh, you know, not every organism would find pleasant. Access to sunlight is a big one, all right? The sunlight is only going to penetrate the first, you know, few hundred meters of the water column, all right? And once you get past that kind of light zone of the ocean, you don't have photosynthesis occurring very well. And if you don't have those photosynthetic organisms that, you know, you got to remember the photosynthesis is the base of all food chains. So if you don't have that, then um, it makes it harder for other organisms to live uh, deeper below that region. Salinity, which is the amount of salt you may find in the water. Some organisms have a hard time adjusting to major swings in salinity. Um, some are dependent upon a very narrow range of salinity, whereas others might be able to handle influx of fresh water or um, increases in salinity. But what you know, high or high, real high salinity um, becomes problematic, um, as we've already talked about in class. You know, if you have high salt content, then that starts pulling water from all of your cells, want to leave your cells because the concentrations are so high of solutes outside of your cells that water will want, you'll, you'll sort of start desiccating and drying out, and that's not good for a living thing. So salt plays a role. Um, other limiting factors include dissolved oxygen, um, because all organisms rest, you know, do aerobic respiration and they need that oxygen so that they can get the, all the cells can get the energy that they need. Um, and dissolved oxygen is dependent upon temperature and the number of producers and consumers in a given region. Um, wind also will impact it because basically oxygen enters through the atmosphere or is added due to photosynthesis and it has to get mixed through the water column. Dissolved carbon dioxide is also an issue. Photosynthesis is occurring in the water and photosynthesis needs carbon dioxide. So that plays a role. Availability of nutrients. Um, some areas have higher concentrations of nutrients than others. Uh, basically, if you're close to shore, you get a lot of runoff from land and that runoff from land actually adds a great deal of nutrients to the water most of the time. Sometimes it over adds nutrients and will get harmful algae blooms like those uh, um, red tides. 
but other times um, natural runoff of nutrients is necessary for life in the ocean. Unfortunately, there's also pollutants that get washed away into the oceans. Carbon plays a big role, of course, um, enters through carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and anaerobic respiration. It's removed by photosynthesis, so it's a good part of the carbon cycle. And the oceans, of course, we already mentioned, um, perform a sort of, they're called a carbon dioxide sink, so they, they actually store carbon dioxide over long term. And nitrogen is an important nutrient also, and we talked about nitrogen before. Nitrogen is important for protein building, um, and it's an important component for photosynthesis as well, for the chlorophyll molecule. So lots of different things impact organisms living. All right, and that covers limiting factors. Okay, there's two major life zones. There's a pelagic life zone. Um, which is basically the open ocean, uh, anything that's swimming in the water column. And you don't have to know these terms, but these include neuritic, epipelagic, mesopelagic, bathypelagic, and abyssal pelagic. And we'll go through these, but you, again, you won't have to know specifics on them. Um, but it's all those fish that you find swimming around, and jellyfish too, and all sorts of things in the open ocean. The other life zone is the benthic, which we've already sort of mentioned. Uh, benthos are bottom environments, and these include subneuritic, suboceanic, which include the bathal, abyssal, and hadal zones of the um, oceans. And again, includes the things that like to stay on the bottom or attached to the bottom or rarely leave the bottom. If you look at how this breaks down according to depth in meters, you'll see that, you know, our, our first zone here um, from zero down to about 200 meters is known as the euphotic zone. This is the one where light easily penetrates and where photosynthesis can easily occur. All right. And then we have another section called the bathial zone. Um, that's more of a midwater range. It's a twilight zone, so to speak. Um, there is a little bit of light but not a lot, and the organisms here tend to move up into the euphotic zone and back down again um, in sort of a weird, you know, diurnal or daily migratory pattern um, in order to feed and, and then escape back down into the twilight to avoid predators. Um, and then in the last deep, deep zone, all the way down to the bottom is known as the abyssal zone, okay? Another picture of that uh, showing open water zones. You have epipelagic again in that first um, hundred meter, you know, a couple hundred meters. Uh, you got mesopelagic, bathypelagic, and then abyssopelagic. All right, the pelagic open ocean. Um, if you are near the coast, it's known as the neuritic zone. So nearby is known as neuritic. And it's from the shore to 200 meters of depth. It is highly, highly, highly productive. And some of the stuff we were just talking about in limiting factors may give you the hint as to why it's so productive. Maybe I hear some people thinking that out there. It's mainly because of the nutrient runoff from land. When you have that nutrient runoff from land in combination with no limit to sunlight, when you have you know, productive light available for your producers, you end up with a really rich, um, nutrient-strong ecosystem. And, and because of that, it's really important economically to us because this is where predominantly we find um, fisheries, uh, we find um, you know, their, their homes for baby fish that are important for fisheries. Uh, it's all sorts of stuff that's going on in this region. Then there's the oceanic zone that's pelagic. Um, in the first layer of the oceanic zone where you still have a lot of sunlight, it also is fairly productive, but it doesn't have that nutrient runoff from land. So it's, it's a little bit more sparse and not as, as a strong of a, of a product productivity region 
um, but there's still all sorts of interesting things that you find in this in this area from the surface to 200 meters. It's characterized by non-mobile producers, uh, stuff just little plankton, you know, phytoplankton, and uh, very mobile consumers, um, schooling fish, uh, sharks, um, whales, dolphins, all sorts of stuff. Then as you get deeper in the oceanic pelagic zone into the mesopelagic, um, organisms will move up and down. As I already talked, they'll migrate up and down in the water to feed and then back down again to avoid predators. You'll find several organisms that have bioluminescence that is used to communicate between each other and also to attract prey. Here's some examples of those organisms over here. We've got a nautilus, which is related to the squid. We've got um, one of our deep sea anglers right here. And we've got a nice comb jelly over here. And comb jellies exist also in the euphotic zone, in that upper epipelagic zone. Um, and we may see some of those at the coast as well. All right, other zones, bathypelagic and abyssopelagic. These are sort of mid to deep waters regions, virtually no light. Food is scarce, so organisms tend to be opportunistic and have really large mouths and really big stomachs so they can actually swallow things that are bigger than they are and then they don't have to eat for a while. Interesting adaptations, scary looking fish, although usually not very big. Uh, benthic habitats, if you're close to shore, um, again, they're gonna be highly productive because of that runoff from land. Lots of light, lots of nutrients, lots of biodiversity. Um, there's two different forms of neuritic habitats, near shore benthic habitats, and these include rocky bottoms where things tend to be attached and hang on for dear life because of wave action, wash, you know, would wash them away if they didn't hang on, or soft bottom habitats uh, where organisms tend to be burrowers, and that's what you sort of see down here at the bottom are things that would burrow into the sand to avoid getting washed away by the waves. Deeper oceans. Um, Again, organisms are opportunistic. Uh, they tend to be feeding off of um, often what's called uh, marine snow. So as things die and get decomposed, little you know bits of that will float down and settle on the bottom of the of the deeper oceans. And there are organisms designed to come, you know, sort of scavengers that will come along and and feed off of that. Or they just sit there and kind of wait for currents to blow things by them that they can catch. They have ways, little tentacly things sometimes, ways of catching things. There's some special habitats, of course, things like hydrothermal vents that are based on um, chemosynthesis. They don't need light. They use chemicals to actually generate ATP energy for themselves um, and food. And uh, But they have extreme ranges of temperature and high pressures um, it's, it's a crazy habitat. There's also coral reefs, of course, which um, they have some very specific limiting factors. They need a narrow margin of temperature. They need very clear water. Um, and they need an also very specific salinity range. Um, so they're highly susceptible to changes in climate because of these things and tend to be sort of, you know, canaries as far as climate indicators, you know, because when they start doing bad, we know, you know, that's not very good. Other special habitats um, include estuaries, wetlands, and salt marshes. Estuaries are those places where um, fresh water meets the ocean, like where rivers meet the ocean. And it's sort of, you know, what our basic habitat is down at Corpus and Port Aransas. Um, Again, because these rivers bring runoff from land, um, it creates highly productive uh, areas, and they're economically important. Um, all their breeding grounds for many marine species, all of these little grasses and mangrove roots and things like that provide hiding places for baby fish to grow up. And that's important that they have those habitats, otherwise we'd lose um, those fish. They also are good for diluting and filtering um, sediments, excess nutrients, pollutants out of the water and preventing them from getting, getting out to sea. Uh, they're wonderful filtration systems, really. And they also buffer flooding for near shore communities.
we talk about human impacts, unfortunately there's a lot. Um, if you look at this map here, you'll notice that a majority of the world's population actually lives close to coasts. Um, and if you think about uh, high, high densely populated regions, uh, you know, here down in um, Brazil or over in India, there's just huge regions of people that live um, that live around coastal regions right here along the Nile. Since 1900, we in the U.S. have lost approximately half of the coastal wetlands, primarily through coastal development. So overdevelopment is ruining um, habitats along the coast that work to buffer and filter our water and prevent flooding and all those sorts of things. Um, so any hurricanes or natural storms that occur um, could potentially do more damage. And unfortunately, there's more. Um, here's a nice infographic, actually not so nice. 75% uh, of ocean pollution originates on land. 80% of fish in fishing zones are overfished. Um, there's, you know, the surf, due to circulation of ocean currents, there's huge garbage patches now in the ocean that are massive. Um, the oceans feed nearly three and a half billion humans. 90% uh, of our planet's trade takes place by sea, all those large ocean going um, cargo ships. 50% uh, of the world's population at least lives close to that. We already mentioned that lives close to um, the coast. And 97% um, of the water available on earth basically is represented by the ocean. So it's, uh, it's important, you know, more than 50% of the oxygen in the world is generated by uh, photosynthetic organisms in the ocean. So it's important that we protect it. Um, fisheries that were having a, um, a huge negative impact. Uh, some experts believe that by 2050, the world fisheries are going to collapse. You know, right now, 80% of the world's fish stocks are already fully exploited. Um, th at least 300,000 whales and dolphins are killed each year, killed each year in nets that were designed for other fish. They're, you know, they're, they're called bycatch. They're things that they didn't mean to catch, but they caught them anyway, and so they result, you know, ended up killing them. Um, a fifth of fish are caught illegally in the world. Uh, and it generates $50 billion, so it's sort of a hard thing to stop because these illegal fisheries are getting, you know, basically rewarded for doing what they're doing because they're getting paid for their fish. 90% uh, of predatory fish, tuna shark, swordfish, cod, halibut, 90% of them, of those big fish, are gone. That's, that's, I mean, when does it stop? All right. And then the garbage patch that I mentioned in the last one is, is two times the size of the United States currently. It's out in the middle of the Pacific. Um, these are issues. These are issues that your generation, you know, is going to need to deal with. And it's just something for you to sort of think about. And you're being watched. And hopefully you won't lose um, the kind of precious life that is found in the oceans. So um, our, world, our water world is precious and we need to protect it. All right, that's all I got.